a ghostly hulk on a sandy grave off the South American coast. Yet this crumbling tomb was once a pride of the Nazi fleet, a deadly weapon of war that sent scores of sailors and ships to the bottom. They were, in fact, in one of the best submarines in the German Navy. She's armed with 15 torpedoes as well as a deck gun, and she is an absolutely deadly weapon of war. In command, a legendary U-boat ace, respected and admired on both sides. Guggenberger was an excellent commanding officer and leader of men. He was in the finest tradition of the German submarine commanders. But the tide turned, and the wolf packs were ruthlessly hunted down. They call for battle station, so all the guns are manned. Every bomb can be a hit. If someone says they weren't afraid, they're lying. The U-513 vanished, but the U-995 is a rare survivor. More than 600 of her type were unleashed to prowl the seas. She's the only one left. Captured in 1945, she now rests on a beach below a memorial to the thousands of German sailors who didn't come back. It's interesting how the, the legend of the, the German grey wolves endures to this day. Um, it's particularly interesting that, that people in the, in the US and Britain seem to be more fascinated by German submariners than they are with the exploits of their own. And I think we can only put it down really to um, the fascination with the, with the underdog, with the defeated enemy, um, with a lost cause. Brazilian sailor and entrepreneur Wilfredo Schurman is one of those captivated by the legend. When he heard the intriguing tale of a U-boat sunk off the coast of his native Brazil, he had to find it. Eu fui é, atrás do submarino pela história em si, é, muito envolvente. The U-boat has an incredibly engaging history. It enthralled me immediately. It was as if I was being pulled into this search. Of course, not least because of my family. My father is German. I'm desperate to find out what this U-boat meant for the war. The Brazilian businessman was chasing a ghost. A legend that vanished under the waves in 1943. A lone wolf, the U-513. People said, forget it, Vilfredo. You will never find a thing. Give up, you're dreaming. I said, no, we will find it. He wandered back through time to the desperate early days of the war when the so-called wolf packs ruled the waves. German U-boats tore into Atlantic convoys. Vital supplies needed to keep Britain and her allies afloat were sent into the abyss, along with many thousands of merchant seamen. There's no doubt that early in the war, the Germans could have knocked Britain out using U-boats. Even the mightiest warships in the sheltered British naval base of Scapa Flow weren't safe after a grey wolf crept in. Probably one of the greatest successes scored by the U-boat arm was Gunter Prien's penetration of Scapa Flow in 1939. This was striking at the Royal Navy right in its lair, in its prime base. Um, and the propaganda's success of this was extraordinary. It was a navigational masterpiece. And on top of that, there were barriers in front of the entrance in this relatively small space. Strong currents were also prevalent there. An American journalist described Gunter Prien as clean cut and cocky. He was also persistent. He fired three torpedoes at the battleship Royal Oak. All three failed. At great risk, he launched another attack. British power was symbolized by its fleet, by its sea power. And here are young representatives of the Third Reich proving that the old British Empire hasn't got the strength. 
Royal Oak was an old ship. Um, she hadn't been modernised, but to sink her in Britain's base, the base of what was still seen as the greatest Royal Navy in the world, or the greatest Navy in the world, was an extraordinary success. Das siegreiche U-Boot, das bei Scapa Flow die Royal Oak versenkte, kehrt in seinen Heimathafen zurück. Preen became a celebrity, paraded before the propaganda cameras. Wir haben uns durchgemogelt durch die Bewachung und waren plötzlich drin. Haben unsere Torpedos gelöst, im nächsten Augenblick krachte es und dann flog die Royal Oak in die Luft. Der Eindruck war unermesslich. The Nazi propaganda machine went into overdrive after Prien's success. So um, he was interviewed by Hitler, he was filmed, he was awarded the Knight's Cross. Um, he was made into a, a young hero of the Third Reich. Hitler was delighted. His plans to conquer Europe and the Soviet Union would be much easier with Britain out of the war. U-boats could cut supply lines and starve the island nation into submission. Dönitz, the, German, the commander of the German submarines, argued this, that if he had enough submarines, he could sink 600,000 tons of shipping per month, and this would knock Britain out of the war. The Nazi Kriegsmarine started with a fleet of 57 submarines. More than 1,100 U-boats would be launched into battle. But as well as boats, the German Navy needed sailors to man them. A lot of young men would have looked at the U-boat arm and seen them as a glamorous, successful, the, the spear point of the German Navy when the rest of the fleet was spending an awful lot of time in port. And also, we, we must remember that young men everywhere always think of themselves as invincible. Horst Bredau was just 17 when he enlisted. I desperately wanted to join the U-boat units when I joined the Navy. You were really put through the mill. They checked you thoroughly. You had to prove yourself. Recruits were sworn in with the Admiral Dernitz mantra, attack, approach, sink it. This was an elite which you would want to connect yourself with. And it's a sign, I think, of the success of the propaganda machine, the cult of the U-boat aces, that it was so attractive for people to volunteer for what turned out perhaps to be a rather nasty, brutish and short experience of operating submarines. But life at sea wasn't always the worst option. You could sit in a foxhole in the Russian front, you could perhaps train up as a, an ill-trained night fighter pilot, or you could go to sea in submarines where the risks on patrol were extraordinary, but when you came back, you were in France, in relative safety, in a barracks, in relative comfort. Sailors eager for adventure could travel across the globe in a new generation of long-distance U-boats. The U-513 was one of them. U-513 was a formidable weapon. She is a Type 9C U-boat. These are long-range U-boats designed for distant ocean patrolling. Sometimes they're called U-cruisers. Um, so their endurance was something like 13,500 miles instead of about 8.5 for a standard Type 7C boat. She's armed with 15 torpedoes as well as a deck gun and she is an absolutely deadly weapon of war. Her crew claimed four kills in a month, but then suffered a series of breakdowns in mechanics and morale. The commander was replaced by one of the most dynamic officers in the fleet, a 28-year-old who was already a legend. Friedrich Guggenberger is an interesting character. Um, he's often portrayed as a, as a maverick U-boat commander, and in fact, Admiral Dönitz used to reprimand him for the length of his hair. Um, but he was successful. He knew how to get results. By reputation, he handled his submarine in a very aggressive kind of way. Um, he was in the finest tradition of the German submarine commanders in that sense. He'd already sent at least a dozen ships to the bottom, including one stunning kill that sunk a prize of Britain's Royal Navy. Guggenberger's moment in the sun before this, and the moment where he really becomes a U-boat ace, is when he torpedoes the British aircraft carrier HMS Art Royal. The Germans have been going after Art Royal since the start of the war and have repeatedly claimed to have sunk her, but Guggenberger is the man who actually gets her. 
It blasted another hole in British naval pride. That was a real success, because it created a hole. And in those days, you didn't have this serial manufacture of aircraft carriers. So every one of them was a serious loss for the enemy. Guggenberger became another fated U-boat ace, a hero of Nazi Germany. Kapitän Leutnant Guggenberger, der Kommandant eines der beiden erfolgreichen Unterseeboote. Ark Royal was a very important ship to both sides. So it was natural that Guggenberger, as the man who sank her, should be given the highest possible gallantry award with the maximum level of publicity. The British were sad that Ark Royal had finally been sunk. The Germans were overjoyed. He was awarded one of the highest honors by the Führer himself, the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. In May 1943, he had a new boat and a new mission. Loaded with torpedoes, enough food for 16 weeks and tropical uniforms, they were bound for exotic, dangerous waters. The deadly consequences of Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 had spread far beyond the Pacific. Hitler declared war on America three days later. Her vast industrial and military might brought the wolf packs to heel. Once the US is in the war, the Western Hemisphere basically becomes just as dangerous as the Mid-Atlantic and the East for U-boats. Uh, the entire might of the US Navy, the US Coast Guard, um, plus their allies, eventually like the Brazilians, becomes ranged against the German submarines. America could build merchant ships faster than the Germans could sink them. As well as tanks and planes, factories churned out a stream of so-called Liberty ships. The key to the mass production of merchant ships was to come up with a simple, common design, which could be welded together quite rapidly. The tonnage lost could be replaced, and indeed the size of the Allied merchant fleet increased. No matter how many ships the U-boat sunk, there were two or three more to take their place. But fear of the grey wolves remained, and for good reason. Long-range U-boats were still prowling far and wide. In September 1942, the troop ship Laconia set sail from Cape Town for Liverpool. Civilians on board included 14-year-old Josephine Pratchett and her family. At that time, the Atlantic U-boat war was at its height. There were huge, tremendous successes for the U-boats. The ship was very slow, belching out black smoke the whole time. And we knew we had to go through the Atlantic, where they all were. Unfortunately for the Laconia, the U-156 was lurking off the West African coast. The passenger ship Laconia was armed and operating as a troop ship, so she was absolutely a valid target. Lieutenant Commander Werner Hartenstein seized the opportunity to send another Allied ship to the bottom. It was horrendous. The ship lurched very badly, the explosion was extremely loud, and then there was a kind of incredulity, really, you know, a hush, before the next torpedo struck. Many survivors were floundering in the water, including Italian prisoners, Lieutenant Commander Werner Hartenstein's allies. Then he realized there were Italians on board. There were prisoners on board, and his conscience was now stronger than any rules of war. At great risk to himself and his men, Hartenstein surfaced and called other U-boats to help. This periscope came towards us, the submarine surfaced, and the captain came onto the deck, and with a megaphone, he said, <coughs> in perfect English. I would like all the women and children to come aboard my ship. Can you imagine the enemy saying that? 
We must also remember that what motivated him was the fact that he heard the voices of Italian prisoners of war in the water, his allies. Whether he would have gone to the rescue of Allied survivors alone, who knows? But there's no doubt he did try and help everybody who was in the water. In times of war, when you think what could have happened, so you expect you could be rescued by your own side, but you don't expect to be rescued by the other side, do you, really? But we were. And uh, not only that, but we were treated extremely well, and I've lived to tell the tale. Some survivors were taken on board the U-boats. Others were towed in lifeboats behind them. It was one of the most elaborate rescue operations of the war. The lifeboats were being towed by the submarines, and he tried very hard to save as many survivors as possible, making himself extremely vulnerable. Hartenstein made an open radio call in English, assuring any ships that helped would not be attacked. It attracted deadly attention. It was an enemy submarine. Here's a chance to sink it. Try and sink it. Shoot first and ask questions afterwards. It's a ruthless decision, but they've got a chance to get a U-boat on the surface at a point where the U-boat war is the single biggest threat that the Allies are facing. He said, it's too dangerous. I can't keep you on board anymore. Survivors were cut loose. Many were rescued by French ships. The U-156 escaped and received a stern general order from headquarters. One of the interesting consequences of um, the Hartenstein incident is that Dönitz issues the Laconian order forbidding U-boat commanders from helping survivors. In reality, it doesn't make any difference. Conditions for U-boat commanders are getting very, very difficult at this point, and it's not long before no commander can afford the luxury of, of indulging in this kind of behaviour, regardless of whether they get the opportunity or not. Like her sister boat involved in the Laconia incident, the U-513 was a long-range weapon. She left her French base in Lorient on the 18th of May, 1943. Her skipper, Friedrich Guggenberger, could have picked a safer option as an instructor. The German Navy would try to use the expertise of somebody like Guggenberger, and so there was good reason to use people like him in the training mode. But of course, these submarine commanders are aggressive. It's in their bones. And therefore, he wanted to be sent out on patrol again. For most of her crew, it was the fourth assignment at sea. Torpedo mechanic Gunther Bleiser was just a teenager, obliged to serve his Führer. I was 14 and my husband was 17 at the time and our childhood romance grew, but then he had to become a soldier before he'd even turned 18. His engineering skills were in demand. Most young men who left on a U-boat never came back, but Margarete would wait for her sweetheart. I knew he was the one when I was 13, and he was. It was a journey into the unknown. For operational security reasons, U-boat crews weren't told where they were going until they'd left harbour. Obviously, what you don't want is the boys out for a night on the town in the bars of Lorient, spouting to the locals about where they're going the next day. Walter Wittig was a radio operator on a sister ship of U-513. Of course, you would think what was ahead when you left on assignment. Where are we going? If someone says they weren't afraid, they're lying. Once out at sea, the orders finally came through. The U-513 faced a long voyage, far beyond the relative safety of her home base on the French coast. She set a course for the other side of the Atlantic, for the waters south of Rio de Janeiro.
it was a rich hunting ground for freighters carrying a vital raw material for the Allied war effort. Brazil is essentially the only large-scale source of rubber remaining to the Allies. The Germans allied the Japanese has caught, have captured nearly all the other major rubber producing areas, Indonesia, Malaya and so on. So Brazilian rubber becomes this vital resource for the Allied war effort. And the Germans know this. It's a long, long way away, but they're still able to dispatch these long-range Type 9 U-boats. On the long, uneventful voyage, the commander had to ensure his crew were shipshape. It gave them the best possible chance of making it back home to their loved ones. He's well aware that he's got a, perhaps a less than 100% efficient crew. He drills them and trains them relentlessly as they, as they cross the Atlantic. Big Type 9 Cs, these were very large U-boats, and they were known as slow divers. Guggenberg made sure that he ran, as we say in English, a tight ship, that the training of every member of the crew was absolutely vital to the efficiency of the submarine, and that, to a very considerable extent, the crew would have to be driven to make sure that they were operating at maximum efficiency. Meine Herren, das war eine Übung. 45 Sekunden. Das ist noch zu langsam. And with an acknowledged ace in command, I suspect that the men, although they might grumble about it, probably felt confident in the end that they were in fact in one of the best submarines in the German Navy. In fact, their boat had changed from being one of the worst to being one of the most potentially effective submarines in the Kriegsmarine. In a real attack, a U-boat on the surface was a sitting duck. The commander presses the alarm signal and that means an emergency dive. Nobody knows if this is an exercise or the real thing. It took 35 seconds for a Type 9C to crash dive and, and get underwater. And it, it was absolutely essential that they shaved every second that they could after that time. Meine Herren, 35 Sekunden. Passable Leistung. Lassen Sie auftauchen. Auftauchen! U-boats had to maintain a constant watch. Smoke on the horizon meant a possible target or an attacker closing in. But a long voyage to Brazil was mostly uneventful, hot, stinking, and claustrophobic. We always said that the engineers designed a fantastic boat with fantastic technology, but when they finished, they realized, dear God, people have to go in there too. A chance to escape the cramped confines came when the horizon was clear and the water calm. The open sea, a welcome reprieve from a steamy interior on a tropical voyage. It was a mixture of sweat, Torpedo fumes, chlorine fumes from the battery, also the smell of the galley. Now imagine all this together in one room. Eventually you no longer perceive it. But the circumstances under which the crew had to live in the U-boats are hard to imagine. Apart from the occasional rendezvous with supply vessels, including modified U-boats dubbed milk cows, crews were on their own. Their lives depended on the seaworthiness of their boat, and there was a vast array of machinery to maintain. The all-important batteries needed constant topping up with fresh water. U-513 chief engineer Gunther Seidel was fanatical about preserving water. One of the major problems submarines face right from the start 
was their very limited capacity to carry fresh water. And this had effects on submariners' way of life. Washing and operating conventional submarines don't go together. Even today, in fact, conservation of water is very important. But when the miserly Zeidel banned coffee, the commander stepped in. Guggenberger was an excellent commanding officer and leader of men, but he also has an absolutely finely nuanced eye for reading his men's moods. Herr Kaloy, ich sollte mich melden. Seidel, geben Sie den Männern Ihren Kaffee. So sparsam sollten wir auch nicht sein in Ordnung. A good example of that is the story of, of his chief engineer banning coffee to preserve water, and, and one has some sympathy for him. Water's a vital resource. But Guggenberger reads the mood and goes, no, the men are having their coffee, and immediately gets them on side. Die Kameradschaft war ein wichtiges Thema. Camaraderie was an important thing on board. Of course, there was a difference between superiors and subordinates but not in the same way as it was on a big ship or on land. That didn't exist on a U-boat. It was a tight-knit community. Crammed together in a small steel tube thousands of miles from home, events like birthdays broke the monotony of endless days at sea. It's not possible to teach someone who's been blind from birth about colour. And if you haven't lived through it, this state of being completely reliant on each other, it's difficult to understand what this companionship actually meant. Submariners could spend weeks at sea without seeing another boat. Yet their orders were clear. Sink ships. You travel back and forth, hoping you will come across someone, anyone. After two months at sea, the lookout spotted a target on the 21st of June. Sinking an enemy ship with a torpedo from a submarine is a really tricky business. It's a scientific, mathematical game. What the commanding officer has to do is look at his target, and he has to judge where it's going to be when his torpedo reaches it. So he's looking at the speed and course of the target. He's looking at the speed and direction of travel of his torpedo. And if he gets it right, they'll meet on the cross. 1800 meter. Lage 30. Geschwindigkeit. 9 Knoten. What a submarine captain can't do is stay on the surface with his periscope and look at what's happening. It's far too dangerous. Lage laufend. Torpedo rohrwässern. So what he does is he will fire his torpedo, do his calculations, fire his torpedo. Torpedo Rohr 2, los! Los. And then the eels go off and we sit and wait. Eyes on the stopwatch to see how much longer they should travel and wait for the bang. The stopwatch is his running time for that torpedo. When it reaches, say, 50 seconds or two minutes or four minutes, he should hear the thump. Good, den haben wir! The Swedish freighter Venezia was sunk. The crew saved themselves. But this wasn't always the case. When they managed to sink one, they all cheered. The crew was elated. It's understandable this was their job. For most U-boat crews, such elation was short-lived. Allied ships and planes worked together to protect convoys, 
and to hunt and destroy boats like the U-513. By 43, you are facing a mature anti-submarine system. There are some ships are in convoy, other ships are not, but the Americans have developed a very effective hunter-killer system for dealing with submarines. And as Guggenberger found off the Brazilian coast in the summer of 1943, it was almost as bad as being in mid-Atlantic. Bad weather was no cover. The hunter killers could still find a U-boat in a storm. The most important thing was to get as deep as possible, as fast as possible. On the surface, a U-boat is just a very thin-skinned, slow and very vulnerable little boat. Silence on a submerged submarine is vital if you're not going to be found. Ping is active sonar. Passive sonar is a guy with headphones and effectively ears on the side of his ship, and they can hear the slightest noise. You can only be really quiet. Don't run about. All machines are off. But other than that, you can do virtually nothing. That's the guy who would hear you drop your pen on the deck. Once you've done that, the searching warship knows that there's a submarine there. 60 Then they can start pinging with their active sonar. That's when they learn to pray. And find you, and find how deep you are, and find how far away you are, and then you're essentially dead. Every bomb can be a hit. What's important is that the bombs explode above the boat and not below the boat. If they explode below, it's usually all over. You can't really describe it. Once, we had a situation where it went on from 8 in the morning until 10 at night. And then you have three ships up there, and they cross over and take turns discharging bombs. The stress of being repeatedly depth charged and hunted down for hours and hours and hours at a time is again almost inconceivable for us today. The, the psychological reflex is to fight or flee, and the submariner can't do that, he just to sit there and take it. That's when you try not to think about anything. American planes sunk at least 16 U-boats in the South Atlantic in 1943 and 44. At the beginning of July 1943, the U-513 had survived to kill another day. Once a target was spotted, the crew tried to identify it using a shipping register. The U-513 scored five impressive kills off the Brazilian coast, including two American-built Liberty freighters. Guggenberger manages to sink five ships off the coast of Brazil in the summer of 1943. This is not a good time for U-boats. The U-boat campaign is on the wane here. The U-boat army is being defeated. And it speaks volumes for his qualities as a commanding officer that he manages to achieve that kind of success rate in a very difficult period for submarine commanders. The 
but success seems to have sparked a rare moment of carelessness by the veteran U-boat ace. The U-513 sent a radio report back to headquarters. At the start of the war, that was normal. But other than that, we hardly ever sent long radio messages. I only ever sent a single message from the Brazilian coastline, and that was a signal with seven letters. Even a short message could reveal a U-boat's position. You need two receivers, both of which will intercept the same wireless transmission. What you get then is a cross bearing, and if you run down the bearings where they cross, that's exactly where the U-boat is. And then you can dispatch escort forces and hunter killer groups to go and find the submarine and sink it. Basically, what he was saying in code was, here I am, come and kill me. American Mariner seaplanes were a lethal threat, able to zero in on any U-boat caught on the surface. The Americans had a very effective radio direction finding system for, as we say, queuing flying boats to go out and search in areas. This is a great big lumbering flying boat, bristling with weaponry, capable of flying thousands of miles out across the ocean and back again. And when this aircraft encounters U-513 on the surface, the odds are heavily in favor of the pilot. I decided to turn on the radar and flipped it on and started watching it a while. And then I saw this very peculiar blip, which was very sharp and very distinct. I thought it was a fishing boat at first. It was a little curve to it, but it was so bright, it just, just jumped out at you. It didn't seem quite right for a wooden vessel. One of the, the bombardier, he got binoculars, and he said it's a submarine. And then Roy, Roy started working his way into the clouds so that he would be better concealed. Gutenberger is caught napping by the Mariner patrol aircraft. Um, there are several options he could have done. He could have immediately ordered his crew below and crash dived as soon as possible. but it's still going to take 35 seconds, which would have seemed agonizingly long. Basically, he's lost the battle, really, when that aircraft catches him unawares. They call for battle station, so all the guns are manned. According to one account, the deck gun jammed. But whatever firepower was available, it was no match for the Mariner. The greatest terror for any U-boat commander in 1943 is to be caught on the surface by an aircraft. An aircraft is an almost guaranteed U-boat killer. And certainly what submarines don't have is a chance of fighting out um, a battle against an aeroplane. The Mariner dropped depth charges around the U-513. A killer blow exploded just below the boat. Torpedo mechanic Gunter Bleiser was one of the lucky few, saved by a shipmate. He had seen the aircraft and called down, Gunter, come up here. We'll never know if it was intuition. If that hadn't happened, he would have sunk with the rest of them. For most of those on board, the boat became their tomb. Sixty-six years later, the search for the U-513 started with the former American airman who played a key role in sinking it. Hello, Mr. Storz. Nice to meet Determined you. to find the enigmatic wreck off his native Brazil, businessman Wilfredo Schurman was hunting for clues. The U-513 kill daubed on the plane that sent her to the bottom. 
The former airman had the approximate coordinates of where his crew had sunk her. I don't really know. You could, you could take, in there they give the position that the Navy thinks it was. And you can figure that out, how far offshore we, we were. That's all there is, right? The coordinates were not precise. From Texas, the quest to find the U-513 continued from the Brazilian port of Florianopolis, south of Rio. Local fishermen provided more clues. The locations of mysterious obstacles on the sea floor that tore their nets. It's cold, but inside I'm feeling hot with excitement. <laughs> Another intriguing voyage began to the scene of a fateful battle a hundred kilometers offshore. The crew deployed a side-scan sonar, a radar device they hoped would reveal the lost wreck. But after 17 trips and days of searching, the enigmatic U-boat eluded them. Until a strange signal emerged some 75 meters below the boat. An elated crew were sure they'd found the U-513, but the object was too deep for divers to investigate. A remote-controlled camera was sent down to illuminate what lay in the eerie darkness below. Divers checked that the video link to the ship was working before the camera was directed to the seafloor. There were anxious moments as another apparently featureless sandy vista stretched before them. Until a ghostly shape emerged in the gloom. Almost 70 years after she vanished, the Grey Wolf U-513 was found. A wreck, and also a grave for 46 sailors. torn hull, evidence of the depth charge blast that sent them to their doom. A lucky few escaped in the critical seconds before she sank. After the attack, there were about five or six men in the water. So we circled low and dropped two life rafts. Among the survivors, the captain and legendary U-boat ace, Friedrich Guggenberger. Guggenberger obviously chooses not to go down with his ship. To be honest, this whole issue of, of a captain going down with his, his ship is sentimental rubbish. Uh, a captain's duty on either side is to get back, get back in the war and bring back the lessons that he's learnt from the battle that he's taken part in. And you'll find that on both sides during the Second World War, most commanding officers will try and keep themselves and their men alive. Even when scrambling for their lives, crewmen continued to respect their skipper. 
Er hat sich wohl im Wasser dann unten rum alles He'd taken off his clothes in the water and was only wearing his thick jumper. And then he asked his captain, Captain, may I request to enter the boat? I'm only wearing a jumper. He didn't really want to get in half naked. He was always considering etiquette. Seven survivors made it onto the life rafts before they were picked up by the American Navy. It would be standard operating procedure to call in a surface ship just to see what had happened. And also to pick up survivors. After all, picking up a U-boat captain might yield a certain amount of intelligence, for example. So there wasn't just humanitarian interest in trying to pick up the crew. Even though his U-boat was at the bottom of the South Atlantic, Kapitän Leutnant Guggenberger continued the fight in captivity. With officers like Guggenberger, trying to keep them in was often difficult. And of course, Guggenberg is involved in one of the great escapes on the, uh, on the American side. One of the best illustrations of, of this point that Guggenberger's duty was to, to keep in the war is really the fact that even as a prisoner in the United States, he escapes from captivity twice, um, the first time heading for Mexico. He hasn't really got much of a chance of getting home, although Mexico is neutral. But what he has got a chance of being is a monumental pain in the neck to his captors, um, uh, forcing them to deploy troops, frightening civilians, getting a propaganda success. So he's doing everything he can to stay in the fight, even as a prisoner in the US. Together with 24 others, he staged his own great escape, tunneling out around Christmas 1944. But in the United States, you would stick out like a sore thumb as a, somebody who spoke English with a strong accent, particularly in a state like Arizona. They were recaptured within weeks. There was also no escape for their comrades still fighting a losing war on the high seas. Three in four U-boats never made it home. The survivors of the U-513 were released in 1946. Torpedo mechanic Gunter Bleiser married his childhood sweetheart Margareta, who ensured his compelling tale of service and survival was recorded for this program. As for his acclaimed captain, Friedrich Guggenberger, the exploits and adventures continued long after the war. The thing with most of the U-boat aces is they had a tendency to live fast and die young. Um, Guggenberger survives the war, um, and his career continues. Um, at the end of the war, the German Navy is disbanded. There is no German Navy. So this incredibly intelligent, motivated young guy trains as an architect. When Germany gets a Navy back in the 1950s, he re-enlists. He becomes a senior admiral with a senior position in, in NATO um, and retires you know, with, with the plaudits and honors of not just his nation, but his former enemies. And then he dies this bizarre, mysterious death um, at home as an elderly man, goes for a walk in the forest, never comes back, and his body's found two years later in the woods. It's all part of the intriguing story that compelled another sailor to find Guggenberger's last command, the long-lost wreck of the U-513. Really, it is an incredible feeling that we found this U-boat. We can hardly believe it. I am just ecstatic to be part of its incredible story. It's a story of bravery, desperation and sacrifice on both sides. The naval memorial to German war dead, including more than 30,000 submariners, survives. Not to glorify war, but to pay tribute to the sailors who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country.